Long ago he blessed the earth, born older than the years. And in a stall across he saw the first of many tears. A life of homeless wandering, cast down in sorrow's way. The shepherd seeking for the lost, his life the price he Crucified arose the risen one in splendor, Jehovah's soul defender has won the victory. The crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope for the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. your life you felt the weight of what you'd come to give to drink for us the crimson cup so we might really live at last the time to love and die the dark appointed day that one forsaken moment when your father turned his face away Hi, I'm Brian Leversey, pastor at Fellowship Baptist Church here in Vienna, West Virginia. And we would invite you to come home with us at Fellowship every Sunday on WTAP NBC and WIYE CBS. We know that you'll love worshiping together with us. We look forward to worshiping with you. together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And how many of you know that verse is true, even though it's the least favorite verse we have in our Bible? Because usually somebody's reading that to us while we're in a hospital bed or while something tragic has taken place in our life. And they're trying to convince us that, no, this is going to be good. And you're shaking your head saying, no, this isn't good. And yet we know that God works all things out for our good and for his glory for our good and for his glory. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul's saying, this hasn't worked out the way I planned it or the way I wanted it to. I would imagine that Paul could have thought I would be much more effective if I could be out of prison and I could be ministering to the churches in person and I could be planting additional churches and I could be active for the Lord, but instead I'm locked up in bonds and I'm not able to do what I want to do. 
But that wasn't Paul's attitude. He said, God is working through me in ways that I would have never known if I wouldn't be in this spot that I'm in right now. So let's look at how Paul identified in joy even in this particular circumstance. First of all, I want us to see from our passage this morning, I want us to see the joy of growing gospel reach. This is something Paul connected to, the joy of growing his gospel reach. Notice what he says in verse number 13. So that my bonds, what does he mean? Hey, these shackles that are around my wrists, the shackle that is around my ankle and probably shackled to another Roman guard, these bonds that keep me from doing what I want to do, these bonds that keep me from enacting my plan, these bonds that keep me from being where I would prefer to be, these bonds have been a blessing. And we go, what? What are you talking about, Paul? And how many of you hate those super spiritual people that can make a blessing out of everything? <laughs> really? Are you for real? Come on. Just complain a little bit. Make me feel good about myself, right? But Paul, he didn't get sucked into that. He said, these bonds, I want you to see what they've done. Church of Philippi, don't feel sorry for me. Church of Philippi, don't doubt what God is doing. It may look dire. I'm in bonds. Nobody wants to be where I'm at, but this is where God has me, and this is what he's doing with it. Notice with me, again, verse 13, because of these bonds in Christ, uh, these bonds are manifest in all the palace and in all of their places. What is he saying? You wouldn't think this. Church at Philippi, you wouldn't believe this. This would never cross your mind. But because I'm locked up, more people are hearing the gospel that wouldn't have heard the gospel. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm thrilled with where I'm at. But because I am where I am, guess what? The Roman guard is hearing the gospel. We can look at the book of Acts and we can see where different people in governance heard the gospel because the apostle Paul stood before them and gave witness and declaration of what God had done in his life. He got to speak to the political elite. He got to speak to the religious elite as he went through trial after trial, as he went through prison after prison, as people witnessed him being stoned and shackled and taken away. He was able to extend the reach of the gospel in his life. And instead of complaining with where we're at right now, Instead of being overwhelmed with our trial and our difficulty and instead of being angry at God and angry with the world because of where we find ourselves and our pain and our anguish and our difficulty, why don't we look out at the people that are closest to us, the people who are as well being affected by what we're being affected by and let's see if we can reach out to them. They may only be a few feet away. Paul was more than likely strapped right to a Roman guard while he's writing this letter. He could, hey, talk about reaching out and touching someone. Paul could do that. And wh whoever was around him, Paul wasn't concerned about the bonds. Paul was concerned about the opportunity to be able to speak to people who might be sensitive to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can learn from that this morning because I don't know if you're as good as I am. I'll, I'll try to challenge you any day. I'm pretty good at throwing a pity party. Oh, we've got some players out there too, huh? All right. And I bet I could beat you if I tried real hard. And we can, we can get real sad and real dejected. And, and listen, I'm not, saying, I'm not minimalizing our pain and our anguish. There are things that we can be sad about. And there are things that we can grieve over. And there are things that God will walk with us in in that grief. But we shouldn't come to the point where we don't realize that God can use us right where we're at to reach out and extend the reach of the gospel to those that are around us. There are people because of what you're going through. And I don't know all that you're going through. I know what some of you are going through. You shared it with me. I don't know what all of you are going through. But you're going through some health thing. You're going through some financial thing. You're going through some difficulty, hardship, or trial where you are in a key position to be able to speak to people who might not otherwise see Jesus. And what are we doing with those opportunities? Are we squandering them in our pity party or are we embracing them knowing that life is seasonal? How many of you have been in bad times and good times? You've lived long enough to see both. Life is cyclical. The Apostle Paul is going to write in another passage here in Philippians. He's going to write, hey, I know how to abound. I know how to be abased. I know how to be full. I know how to be hungry. I know how to be filled up and I know how to suffer need. And in everything, I've learned to be content. Are you content with where you're at because God has put you there? And in your contentment with Jesus, are you willing to reach out from where you're at right now and impact another's life? 
You know, even Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, unless you're broken, unless you're split apart, unless you die in your own life, you're not going to be able to affect anybody else. Let's see how Jesus said this. Notice with me, if you would, on the screen, John chapter 12, we're going to read verses 24 and 25. Notice Jesus' words. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And that's what seeds do. They go into the ground, they split apart, and then what's inside that seed comes out and fractures many times over. And where you sow one seed, you're going to grow a bunch of fruit out of that. And so where there's one life that might be broken and sacrificed for the Lord Jesus Christ, it might not be our plan, it might not be the way we drew it up, it might not be our dream, but wherever God puts us and however God leads us, if we're faithful to him, and even if it's breaking us apart, God can use that experience to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he continues this thought, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternity life eternal the problem is is we fall so in love with our life in this world we so we so fall in love with our plans in this world that when god shakes that up and he puts us in a different place we grow angry and bitter and cold and ineffective instead of looking at what god wants to do with us right where we are at we find that paul was in a strange place to find joy but he found the joy of growing gospel reach secondly we find that Paul found the joy of growing gospel boldness. He found the joy of growing gospel boldness. From right there in those bonds, from right there in those chains, he was affecting people he couldn't even see, touch, or be around to become bold in their preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice here as we continue on in verse number 14, Paul speaking again, Hey, and and because of my bonds, church at Philippi, many of the brethren in the Lord now are waxing confident by my bonds and much more bold to speak the word without fear. What was happening? Well, they were observing the life of Paul. They knew he would go into different cities and that he would preach boldly and that he would be beaten and that he would be thrown into prison and they were praying for him and they were supporting him and they were loving him through that. But now that he was locked away and he could no longer go out and preach the word the way he was before. There were people who were seeing his faithfulness and people who were seeing his boldness and now they were rising up and they were saying, you know what, I feel God calling me to be part of this. I feel God working in me to be bold with my faith. I feel, I feel God working in me to be bold in getting the gospel out. And Paul was doing a work he could have never known he would do, being in bonds, by energizing the rest of the church to step up and be bold in preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like that. How many of you like being around people who are bold in the truth? I like that. I believe this. I believe today we need leaders to step up with boldness in the truth and to toe the line and to hold the line and to say, I'm standing for truth. And and listen, whatever happens to me, whether I'm degraded or talked bad about or whether I'm imprisoned or or whatever might happen, I'm going to stand for truth. And I believe people are hungry for truth today. How many of you know we live in a world full of lies and deceit today? And we need people to stand for something and to stand for the truth. And just as Paul in his bonds was seen by other Christians to stand for the truth, they then were emboldened in their faith to go out and to preach the word of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. And maybe in your difficulty, maybe in your trial, you're showing a boldness to remain faithful to God where others would have quit, where others would have given up, where others would have been mad and dejected and left and hidden in a corner. You're being faithful. You're coming to church. You're ministering to others. You have found the joy of the Lord in your life. And even if you're not in the place that you planned, even if you're in a difficulty, you would have never drawn up on your calendar or your agenda. Maybe in your faithfulness, you're affecting people you don't even know you're affecting because they're seeing you and they're watching you and they're beholding your witness and they're beholding your testimony and they're seeing you live boldly in your faith even when it wouldn't be convenient for you to do so. I don't know how many of you are following what's going on over in Russia and Ukraine. I don't know how you can't follow what's going on over there. And my my message tonight is not some message politically or or this morning politically or or geopolitically. I'm not really desiring to dig into that a whole lot. But I have noticed something. I have noticed that as these Russian forces are coming into the Ukraine, 
Uh, the key people in leadership have remained there in Ukraine and they're, they're shooting videos about how they're out with the military and how they're standing their ground and how they're saying, hey, just come and get us. We're not leaving our land. And I don't know how you feel about Ukraine. I know there's corruption in every government. I know that there's really bad situations that exist out there and I'm not trying to get you to feel one way or another. I'm just simply stating a fact. How many of you know there's just something that emboldens people when they see their leaders standing up and saying, we're not gonna flinch? We're not going to fall behind. We're not going to give up. We're going to fight for you. We're going to fight for our freedom. I don't know. There's just something in me. I like that whole don't tread on me kind of thing, you know? And and what does it do? It emboldens people. It emboldens them to do things that maybe they would have never thought they could do. Maybe they would have never seen themselves doing. And I believe that happens in the church. I believe that when we see people emboldened for the greatest cause of all, the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're standing firm and they're being faithful. I believe others witness that and it emboldens them in their life to stand firm and to remain faithful as they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, don't be discouraged where you're at right now. Don't be dejected. You might be in a great place of pain and difficulty, but God could be using you right where you're at as your faithful people are watching you. Now, I was always have loved in my ministry faithful people in the senior saints category who maybe are struggling desperately in their health and yet I'll watch them pull up to the church when other people would have stayed home. Maybe it's even bad weather and they'll get out and they'll let their wheelchair down or they'll grab their walker and their 12 canes or whatever it is they brought with them. And what do they do? They faithfully come into the church of God and they sit and they they listen to the sermon and they greet people and that always, always has affected me from a very young person to even right now watching the faithfulness of people who otherwise probably could have a good excuse not to engage and not to be a part and not to be faithful and yet their desire is to continue to live their faith out as boldly as they can for while they can and that's a blessing to me. A lot of times elderly people will come to me and say, Pastor, I used to do this in the church and I used to do this in the church and I don't feel like I'm doing much of anything and I just can't do a whole lot of anything physically anymore and Pastor, I don't want to feel like I'm not doing anything and I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm seeing their faithfulness and I'm saying, you're doing more than you even know that you're doing just by being here in this room right now. What a blessing it is to see somebody who's bold in their faith. It increases the boldness of others. It encourages others to live out their faith in a faithful manner. Paul found the joy of growing gospel boldness. Hey, who are you making bold because of your life today? Who are you encouraging because of your life today, even if you're going through a difficult circumstance or trial? The joy of growing gospel boldness. Lastly, and we'll be done this morning, Paul found the joy of growing gospel proclamation. He found the joy of growing gospel gospel proclamation. I think that this next section we're going to read is harder than even being in bonds or being in prison because this deals with people who you would think would love you and trust you and they're running you down and they're talking bad about you and they're taking advantage of your bad situation. I think that's almost more painful than just your known enemies locking you up in prison. But that's what Paul is experiencing and it's what he's going to talk about here. Notice his words. Notice what he says. Verse 14. And many of the brethren and the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying this, hey, I'm glad for the boldness of everyone preaching the gospel right now because I'm in prison. And there are some who are preaching the gospel because I'm in prison and they want to kind of pick up the slack and they want to get in the gospel fight and they care about people's souls and they're out there boldly preaching the gospel. And and there are even some others that are out there preaching the gospel. But I know that their motives aren't pure. They're preaching the gospel because they want me to be envious of them. You see, much like in today's environment, you know, you get a big church or a big famous preacher or somebody who's written a lot of books, somebody who preaches on a circuit, it can be very easy for people to try to want to vie for position and influence and and fame and fortune. And so even among preachers and churches and ministry workers, you can have people who are fighting and juxtaposing against each other for position. And that was happening in Paul's time. Paul was well known. He was going around ministering to a lot of churches. People wanted to have him in their church. He was writing letters to these churches. Everybody was looking to Paul for advice and counsel and and the understanding of God's word. 
And so there were those that were sitting back thinking, man, I wish I could be that famous. I wish I could have that kind of platform. I wish that I could have that kind of an audience. I wish I could have that kind of notoriety. And now that Paul was in prison, they're thinking, this is my chance. Hey, I I could go out there and I'm going to have a ministry bigger than Paul's was. And I'm going to do things greater than Paul did. And and as they would do their different things, they'd write their little letters to Paul saying, yeah, we had 50,000 in church today. How'd church go for you today, Paul, in prison, you know? Just discouraging him. Just kicking him while he's down. Paul said, those guys are preaching the gospel too, but I want you to notice Paul's attitude. Paul didn't attack those people. Paul didn't make it his ministry to go after those who were maligning him. Paul instead chose to focus his identity on who he was in Christ. And he says this in verse number 18. He says, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. I'm not going to get caught up in the political nature of what's going on with religious leaders. I'm not going to get involved with trying to compare my ministry with somebody else's ministry. I don't even care if they're gossiping about me. I don't care if they're maligning me. I don't care if they're kicking me while I'm down. There's something more important than me. There's something more important than them. And that's the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, if somebody can learn about Jesus, I'm all for the gospel getting out there. And I love that attitude, I got to tell you this morning. I love that attitude of not being in the ministry for me or, or, or my own persuasion or, or what I want to accomplish, but I love being in the ministry about the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you understand our ministry ought to be about pointing people to Jesus? Not pointing people to programs or buildings or personalities. We ought to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Point people to Jesus. Sometimes we can become discouraged because Christians have let us down. They've not acted in a manner that we would expect a Christian to act in. They've hurt us. Maybe they've maligned us. Maybe they've gossiped about us. Maybe they've tried to position themselves above us at our own expense. It's easy to get caught up in that. It's easy to allow our flesh to cause rifts and division and discord and difficulty. But I love the attitude of the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm just going to keep focused on him. And if the gospel is preached with ill intent, I hope people hear the gospel and get saved. If the gospel is preached with good intent, praise God, I hope people hear the gospel and get saved. This is what Paul said. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And that should be our ministry today. Regardless of what we're going through, regardless of what difficulty we have, it shouldn't be all about me. It should be all about him. And how the gospel can reach others. One point I want to make, and and we'll conclude this morning's service. A lot of people misinterpret doctrinally this passage of scripture. And they use it to support the fact that you don't have to be right doctrinally in order to give the gospel out. They say, well, it doesn't really matter how Christ is preached. As long as he's preached, I'm just glad he's preached. So we can be hold hands with this church or this religion or this movement or this group. I mean, we're all really for Christ anyway. And so as long as Christ is preached, everything is good. And let me just tell you something. Wherever doctrine is wrong, it's wrong. We don't affirm other churches, even if they mention the name of Christ, even if they mention heaven, even if they mention a lot of religious jargon, if they're not right about Jesus, if they're not right on doctrine, if they're not right on truth, their church isn't right, their movement isn't right, their work isn't right. Paul is not trying to say, just go with anybody that mentions Jesus. You've got to be right on the truth. You've got to be right on doctrine. And we tend to do that. We tend to excuse false doctrine. Well, that group is good. They've got good people in there. I think they love Jesus. They say Jesus a lot. They embrace things about Jesus. You know, there's probably not a lot that you could tell in difference between me and them if you just looked at us in our neighborhood. We all mow our lawn the same height, you know. It's all good. No, 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 no. How many of you know Jesus said there's truth? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father bought by me. Oh, but pastor, I'm not talking about main doctrines. I'm talking about little doctrines. I'm talking about doctrines that, you know, you could leave them or take them. They don't get you to heaven or keep you from heaven. Well, this is what I've learned about doctrine. There's no little doctrine. Where you start going off on truth, that truth is a domino effect. And where you compromise on one doctrine, it leads to the fall of other doctrines that lead to apostasy, that lead to the lack of truth. And that's why where we're, we're at as a church, as a whole in America today, a lot of people having a form of godliness, 
but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Just because someone says Jesus and says heaven doesn't mean they're right doctrinally. You need to be in a place that opens up the word of God, preaches the whole counsel of God, teaches clearly line upon line, precept upon precept. This is the truth of God. We don't water down God's word. Doctrine is important and Paul isn't saying preach whatever you want as long as you mention Jesus. Everything is cool. That's not what Paul is saying. We need clear doctrine from the word of God. How many of you are glad we hold the truth of God in our hands this morning? And it needs to be preached and it needs to be taught and it needs to be preached and taught the right way. So Paul is saying as long as they're preaching doctrine, now they might not be preaching with right motives and I can't judge people's motives. I don't know your motives. I can guess what your motives are. But I don't know your motives. I could guess your motives are bad and you can come tell me, no, my motives are good. And I'd have to take you at your word. Your motives are good. I don't read hearts. I don't read minds. How many of you are glad you don't read hearts? You don't read minds. Boy, what a world that would be. I don't, but how many of you understand God knows everything that goes on in our minds and hearts? And while I can't judge motives, I can judge doctrine. The Bible says, test the spirits to see if they be of God. How do we do that? We test doctrine with doctrine from what's been declared in the word of God. So we need this truth. And Paul's saying, as long as Christ is being doctrinally preached, I don't care if their motives are right or wrong. I don't care what they think about me. I want the gospel to be proclaimed. So life, how's it working out for you? Is it just the way you drew it up? Is everything falling in line just the way you thought it would be? Or has there been some suffering and brokenness and disappointment and difficulty? Well, guess what? You're in a strange place to find joy, but you're in a great place to find joy. Because I know that right where God has you, you can increase your gospel reach. I know that right where God has you, you can increase gospel boldness by staying faithful to God right where you're at. I know that right where God has you, you can increase gospel proclamation by not caring so much about comparing yourselves with other people or what's going on in their life, but just simply saying, Jesus, it's all about you. And if other people are hearing you, I'm happy and I choose to be full of joy. I choose to be full of joy.